Hi. Welcome to today's webinar, Things to Consider When Publishing Your First Paper. Today, Eli's Deputy Ed Editor, Detlef Weigel, Executive Director of the Max Planck Institute for De Developmental Biology, will be introducing you to the Eli submission process. This will then be followed by a Q&A session where you will be able to ask Detlef all of your questions. Over to you, Detlef. All right. Thank you, Anya. Yeah, my pleasure to, to be here. Um, I've been with eLife since the beginning. That's almost 10 years when we founded eLife. And uh, our ambition was really to change how publishing and reviewing is, is done. And uh, the goal of uh, today's webinar is to cover the eLife uh, process. And uh, what I hope you will take away is, uh, well, both that you learn how we do things at eLife and that you will hopefully consider Eli for a submission um, for one of your next uh, papers, but also that you learn what we consider are really good practices in terms of reviewing and practices which we hope will become more and more common. In, in fact, since we started Eli almost 10 years ago, some of these uh, practices have already been adopted by, by others. So I'll share my screen and we just get into the middle of uh, um, this. So um, things to consider when publishing your first paper with eLive. What we'll cover today is very brief introduction of eLive and then, as I mentioned more extensively, our approach to peer review. So um, about eLive, our goal is to help scientists accelerate discovery by streamlining um, publishing and the dissemination of new knowledge. And specifically, um, we see eLife as a platform for research communication that encourages and recognizes the most responsible behaviors in science. And you see here already that this is about a lot more than just um, publishing a paper that uh, there's eLife the journal, but there's also eLife at the organization with the goal to change how science is being disseminated and how discoveries are being disseminated and how we as scientists communicate with each other. So what is our approach to peer review? Um, what's important to us is that initial decisions are delivered quickly. So initial decision whether or not we will send something for in-depth review. Um, important, it's uh, active scientists, most of them in academia, but uh, some of them actually also in industry who make the decisions, active scientists, meaning people who run their own labs in consultation with other experts uh, in the field. This is something that we pride ourselves in. We have quite a large board of reviewing editors, um, uh, almost 500. And um, among this board, essentially, no matter what is being submitted from the life sciences, we will find at least one, if not more, experts who really know the field. Um, if we decide something is fit for in-depth review, we request that you upload more information. Um, we then review the work. And importantly, rather than sending you a pile of reviews, which can be you know, often quite disparate, we before discuss what revisions should look like so that you have very clear guidance for revision requests. Our goal is also to limit the rounds of revision. So ideally only one round of revision and uh, ideally uh, also one round of formal uh, reviews. And then both our decision letters and your responses to our criticisms concerns are available for all to read. So how does this practically work? So like any other journal, you upload your manuscript to eLife or if you have um, uploaded it to BioArchive before, it is uh, transmitted from BioArchive to eLife. Um, that's the initial submission. And what this is here to symbolize is that we discuss it. Um, I, as deputy editor, will assign uh, initial submission, and there are three deputy editors 
um, will assign a, an initial submission to one of the senior editors. Um, and we have about 50 of those in all different uh, disciplines of the life sciences. And then the senior editor will normally discuss it with members of the board of reviewing editors. I already mentioned this larger board of about 500 people. And then they will discuss whether or not this is something that we should uh, consider in full. If we decide not to consider it in full, we decline it. And this takes normally average three days, sometimes faster, sometimes a little bit um, slower. So then we invite you to um, a full submission. That is, we ask you to um, provide a bit more information, meta information, and then it goes out to um, peer review. And uh, what this is here to symbolize, when the reviews come in, we have a consultation. And the consultation, you can imagine, is sort of like uh, a, a blog where um, the participants um, leave their, their comments in, they, uh, importantly, they know each other. Um, that's, that's really a very important um, 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 part of this. Um, you know whom you are um, talking to, and my own observation is that makes these exchanges and the discourse a lot more civil than if you have exchanges that are purely anonymous. So there's a discussion, what is the merit of the work, what are concerns, often turns out that say one person learns that really they have been too critical. Another person might learn that they have overlooked something. So it really helps if people talk to each other. And then we'll really try to figure out what is the minimum that is required to make this fit for eLife. So of course, you know, there could be lots of uh, bells and whistles. Um, I suspect quite a few of you have already um, uh, experience this, you submit something for review at a journal and it comes back and you have the feeling, well, these people, these reviewers didn't really review your paper, but they thought about what would a paper look like that they would write and then they tell you how to write your paper. And so really that's what we want to um, very strongly avoid. We want to look at the paper and they say, and then clearly say, this is the minimum that you have to do so that we um, consider it for publication. Um, if we find that you know, overall the advance is not sufficient um, for eLife or that it might just take too long to you know, satisfy what we would like to see, we decline it with the option to transfer the reviews to another journal. So we are part of a group of journals that uh, exchanges reviews. And so if we invite revision, hopefully we'll get back your revision within a couple of months or so, and then it is uh, published in eLife. So initial submission, what does that look like? This is something that I think uh, eLife was one of the first journals. Now more and more journals are doing this. I'm really happy about this because it shows that we have impact. So um, you just upload text and figures as a single PDF. So there is, it doesn't matter um, in what style or format you wrote your paper um, initially. So many of us, when we first start to write manuscripts, we don't really quite know where we eventually want to um, send it. So it doesn't matter to us whether this exactly conforms to our style, you just send it to us. We read it, as I mentioned, senior editor and typically two to three reviewing editors. And following discussion, um, we decide whether to invite full submission and median time. Oh, I just see here, I was uh, exaggerating. So I think the mean is three days, but the median is uh, five days, which is a bit um, higher. Um, you can suggest um, reviewers. So there is this um, screen where you put in the reviewer a name and reviewer um, email. And of course, as is common with uh, many other journals, you can also exclude reviewers. And the suggestion, of course, you can also suggest senior editors, you can um, suggest uh, members of the board of reviewing editors and so on, and you can exclude senior editors. You can exclude members of the board of reviewing editors if you have good reasons to, to do so. So as I already alluded to, when we then in the end discuss the reviews, all the reviewers are known to each other by name. So reviewer knows the comment is open or the comments are open to discussion. Um, what I found is that it 
um, colleagues really think quite carefully what they um, write. And overall, this becomes much more constructive than what, you know, I often have the impression you send manuscripts for submission at a regular journal where um, the reviewers don't talk to each other and also their identity is not known to each other. So this is, you know, sort of what a online consultation might uh, look like. So um, it starts when all the reviews are in, there's a form email that comes from the reviewing editor and the reviewing editor email says, look, we got all the reviews please go to the eLife website, you can see the other reviews, and then, you know, let's start a discussion what we should do with this paper. So, reviewer one might say, I agree, this is important, provides new insight. Reviewer two might say, uh, I don't think they need to perform any uh, new wet lab experiments. Um, I'm willing to waive the functional testing of whatever, but the findings therefore need to be more conservatively discussed. Reviewer three might say, I fully agree with the previous comments. Um, study makes a number of uh, important um, points. And then this is all um, condensed. The reviewing editor writes up a summary. So, and that's in the decision letter. So headline already, you see who the reviewing editor um, uh, was. And then first comes this um, boilerplate. Thank you for submitting your article. Um, was overseen by your reviewing editor and who was the senior editor and then the reviewing editor you see here again name name is up here and then reviewers can disclose their identity they don't have to but they can disclose their identity in the specific case you know two reviewers disclose their identity and dates just what I said reviewers discuss reviews with one another and the reviewing editor has drafted the decision and then here's a summary in this elegant studies report and so on, and uh, um, this is what we expect them to do. All right, so we are already at the end of my brief um, presentation here. So you can ask uh, questions, you can uh, post your questions in the Zoom chat to everyone, and then Anya, who uh, introduced me, she'll invite you to ask your questions. If you want to, or if you don't want to ask the question yourself, she can also read the question uh, out for all of us. Uh, if you're not speaking, please uh, mute yourself. And if you need help, just send a chat message on Zoom to um, Anya. And I assume like the rest of us, you all have become super, uh, uh, super efficient in, in Zoom now. So thank you um, very much for listening to my brief uh, presentation. Uh, please follow us on social media, Twitter, eLife, eLife Innovation, eLife Community. And uh, if you're interested in plants and in evolution, you may also want to consider following my Twitter account. And down here are the organizations uh, which have put serious amounts of money in uh, helping to start and continue eLife, Howard Use Medical Institute in the United States, the Wellcome Trust, in um, Great Britain, the Max Planck Society in Germany, and the Knut and Alice Waldenberg Foundation in Sweden. And that's all I had to say, and I will unshare my screen. All right, and um, it looks like we already have quite a few um, questions here. So Anja, do you wanna um, call up people? Hi, Detlef. Um, did you want to read these ones out as they're having problems? Oh, okay. Okay, so the first question was, will a recording be made available? And it's being recorded, and I think the answer is yes. You already answered that. Um, that, that was from David McCurry. Then Emra Altindis is asking, um, who is from Boston College, what is the main difference between initial submission and full submission in terms of submitted documents? And what's the average time for the review process for um, Eli? So the main difference between initial submission and full submission is initial submission is just whoever uploads it gives the uh, um, contact information. You don't have to upload, you know, all the um, individual authors names and the ORCID IDs and uh, um, all that that comes only in the um, full submission. Um, also, in the initial submission, you don't necessarily have to upload individual um, figures and supplemental material and so on and so forth. Average time for the review process, um, our goal is uh, two to three weeks. 
And it has been fairly constant over the last um, um, few years. And it's actually remarkable because you can you know, imagine with this discussion that does add you know, several, several days to a, to a decision. And also the reviewing editor having to write up the decision. So it's different from an editor just you know, forwarding the, um, uh, the, the reviews. And, when we started out with um, eLife, I, you know, when I talked about eLife, when it was introducing the, the process, I was always uh, joking, what's the difference between eLife and a conventional journal? I said, well, eLife, you get one letter and the letter has a coherent story in terms of, you know, what we want from you and in terms of revisions and whatnot, whereas a conventional journal um, reviews that we get were typically like this, um, the um, editor would forward the reviews and the first reviewer would say, another brilliant paper by the Weigel Lab published immediately. And the second reviewer would say, ah, awful work from the Weigel Lab. As always, it is uh, a complete disaster. And then the third person would say, uh, didn't read it, don't care, whatever you do. And the editor would uh, provide a cover letter that would say, um, dear Dr. Weigel, your esteemed colleagues have reviewed your work. Please address the comments. And you would sit there and scratch your head and have no idea what really to do. So that's, you know, very, very different at Eli. Sorry that I went off on a little rant here. Um, so uh, Frida was asking, can you repeat the timeline of each step? So again, the initial submission, um, I think mean time is a three, median is uh, five days. So it comes back and we say, we want to have the full submission where we want a little bit more information. Um, then we already have this reviewing editor who oversees the review. And then the reviewing editor will um, select additional um, reviewers. And then it depends a little bit on how quickly you get reviewers um, to, 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 to sign on. So that's often really the limiting step, um, get reviewers to take on, um, reviews. It can sometimes be really, really um, frustrating. So, um, and yeah, I don't remember what's the average number of reviewers we have to ask, but it's, it's probably on the order of twice as many as what uh, the number of reviews is that we want to have two to three reviews we want to have. And uh, I think if you only have to ask five or six people, that's, that's pretty good. And not everybody um, responds right away. So that's, Samson, where all of us really can make a difference when you get um, uh, uh, when you get an invitation to review, you're not interested in reviewing it. Please write immediately. It's really remarkable how many people do not, just do not respond. You have no idea whether they will review it or not. And then we, I think it's every two days or so, we send an uh, automated email, and then after six or seven days, so we just make a decision, you know, that it doesn't make any sense bothering these people and further. But it's really remarkable how many people never respond, which, which in a way is really quite, quite sad. Um, all right, so um, Emery asked more questions. Okay, I go down here. Um, then Frida says, doesn't reviewers consulting each other influences their opinions? Shouldn't it be independent? Well, Frida, um, we want um, the uh, reviewers to influence each, each other opinion. So I think I, 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 I get what, um, what, what you're saying or what you worry about. Um, I, I think and a worry that admittedly many of us had before we started this that if there's a power differential between the reviewers, they, you know, that basically people are throwing their weight around that more senior editors prevail. But it's, it's really remarkable, or seeing more senior reviewers, but it's really remarkable that um, you know, we, we've uh, um, reviewed thousands and thousands of, of papers now. And we've, of course, you know, asked our reviewers, our reviewing editors, and, uh, Yes, this complaint has come up maybe once or twice, but it's really, really rare that um, especially junior people feel railroaded. And while I'm already, you know, on this 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 point of uh, um, uh, uh, junior colleagues, we really try hard, and I admit not as good as we could, but we try hard to um, involve early career researchers in our um, uh, in our reviews and consultation. So. Why is it good if uh, uh, reviewers influence each other? Well, because 
I have to say, you know, I have reviewed many, many papers in my lifetime, and I have made plenty of mistakes reviewing papers. And um, we are all just, uh, just humans. You read a paper, you um, overlook um, things um, that you then learn from others that you should have overlooked, or um, it can go the other way that you, know, you are just too, too critical. It turns out that you think, well, why has this not been done? And it's just because you don't know the literature as much. And it turns out this is actually well established and is something that you don't have to um, worry about. All right, um, let's go on here. So, how similar or different, this is from uh, Pavitran Naraginan, is asking how similar or different are considerations when dealing with review articles with respect to research articles. Well, review articles we have done relatively um, um, sparingly and only based on, uh, based on uh, uh, invitation. So, um, but they are also being reviewed just like regular research articles. But I think um, unsolicited requests for reviews, we uh, turn down quite often because we have pretty specific ideas what reviews should um, uh, look like. So we want reviews not be so much just reviews of the literature, but really about you know, new ideas, provocative ideas, perhaps opening up new research um, avenues. Uh, Santila Supaj is asking, what do you think about double-blinded review instead of regular single-blinded review? Will it give advantage for a smaller research group? Um, it's certainly something that we have discussed um, uh, um, quite a bit. So I think the, there are advantages to double-blinded review, but um, our um, overall consensus in the end was that it's an enormous effort to go to double-blinded review and uh, um, many papers are not written in a way where you just strip away um, the author name that uh, it will be unclear who actually wrote the work. So in, in, in many instances, perhaps even most instances, uh, you will have a pretty good idea who um, wrote the paper. So I do see the advantages, but um, it is substantial, it is substantial effort. And for it to really work, you would, have to ask the authors to write it in a way that the um, authors are not recognizable in a, in a anymore. So, um, all right, I, and, 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 and uh, Santila, if, if, if you wanna ask more there or discuss this, uh, very happy to do so. Um, Yu Yuan Li asks for the preprint review process, what should be included in the initial submission step? So really happy, um, thank you for giving me this pointer, Yu Yuan. Um, that we have now this uh, preprint review process. It's a new experiment that we are doing. So normally we have this uh, triage process. That's the process that I outlined. But with preprint review, we uh, commit to reviewing the work. Um, that almost always. So, so of course, if we find there's something flawed in the work, we will not review it. Or if it is outside of our remit, or if um, we just cannot find uh, people who, who can take this on as reviewers. This unfortunately sometimes always also happens. So um, there it's the initial um, submission is uh, really the, is, is like the full submission. Um, all right. Um, Shipra Gohl is asking, what sort of uh, information an editor looks for in the initial review to decide if paper to be sent for detailed review or not? That is, um, that's a very appropriate question, but also one of the most difficult questions to um, answer. So it's, it, it's, it's really, um, what is the advance uh, in, in, in the field? There is a nice um, uh, article that one of our former deputy editors wrote um, Eve Mater, what makes an e-life paper? And I would uh, um, encourage you to look at this, what makes an e-life paper. So sometimes it's, you know, this is something really radical, provocative, not fully um, developed. And uh, other days it's just, you know, okay, this is where we are now. This really gets us to the um, next step. But sometimes it's also, there were a lot of these different things around. And this paper is just a really beautiful paper that uh, collects you know, a lot of different strands, puts them together, and really sort of closes 
um, an, an area of uh, inquiry. So it's, it's difficult to put your uh, exact finger on it, but it's really the overall advance for, for the field, I would um, say. Um, then uh, where, where, let me see where we are. Sakir Hossein is asking, what are the major reasons for editorial rejections? What suggestions do you have for the authors to increase the chance of getting the manuscript review? So again, so the major reason for editorial rejection is just that we often, you know, what we will say is this is, this looks like good, good work, um, solid work, but it's not the sort of, sort of conceptual advance. So ideally, you know, the paper, it will report the discovery of a new biological um, um, principle. Um, Pavitran is asking another question. How does ELAG deal with detection of data manipulation? What are the policies for paper retraction? And how has been your experience in this area? So um, we, we do publish you know, a good number of papers. So we had a few cases um, where a paper had to be retracted. So there is no um, simple answer to this. So, you know, typically, sometimes it's the authors themselves to say, well, sorry, we found out we can't reproduce the data for whatever reason it is. And sometimes it's uh, pointed out by um, an outside source. We give the authors, uh, um, we first look at that, you know, if somebody um, uh, alerts us to uh, potential problems and, you know, um, uh, as an aside, um, I recently only learned about Henson's razor. I knew about Occam's razor. I didn't know about Henson's razor about uh, before. So uh, when there are problems, you know, so problems can happen just because things get overlapped or people didn't fully consider um, something. So um, yes, there is fraud in science, but I think that the bigger problem is just that you know, people just did not fully understand things, and it's 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 really insufficient uh, understanding um, that leads to problems rather than uh, wanting to fake data. So that's the most difficult thing to detect. If somebody starts out with intent to make up stuff, you know, then that's often difficult to see because we assume when we get something for review that you know, authors are, are honest. So again going away from the aside. So coming back to this, we look at, when we are alerted to this, we look at this, make up our mind, um, how serious it is. We consult um, the authors and then based on what the authors um, 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 tell us, we um, look at it again and uh, we either tell them, yeah, there's something that you can amend or we tell them, no, the paper has to be um, retracted. Um, then uh, Santila is asking again about double lined, um, because if a particular group is jumping into a new field of research, um, yeah, I agree with you that, you know, unfortunately there are close-minded people who feel that, you know, newbies don't have, uh, who, who are not properly qualified, don't have a, a reason to be in, in a particular field. I can tell you, um, I have changed the research field many, many times. I started out in neurobiology. I was in animal development. I studied transcription factors. I studied plant development. I got into plant evolution and genomics, and now I'm working at the interface of ecology and evolution. So I completely understand where you come from because I had no formal training in evolutionary biology. I have certainly had no formal training in in, uh, in ecology, and yes, I, I know firsthand that often that can be, can be difficult. So um, then um, Anya has something here. Let me just briefly read this. Uh, so there was, um, in terms of early stage investigator status, so we, or, or, or marking that it comes from early career researchers. So, in the beginning at eLife, um, we, we had this, and I think you can still mark yourself as an you know, early career um, researcher. So the idea is to um, take that into account in practice, what we have found is it's, it's really quite um, difficult to decide how to take this um, 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 into account if something comes from an early career researcher to give them the extra benefit of the doubt. So that's our ambition but it's just really difficult to do it um, formally. When people review work, they um, review the work and they find it really hard to take 
you know, other things into account than what's just in, in front of them. That's unfortunately how it, how it works. Um, Frida is asking, is the submission fee, so I assume uh, Frida means the article processing charge, is it in line with um, other um, journals? There's a lot of discussion about journal fees and a lot of people believe that since someone reviews papers for free, then the publishing should also be free. Well, in the end, it has to be paid for. And so one thing that's uh, what we do, what is very different from, I think, pretty much any other journal, we actually publish a financial report every year. So you can actually look at what our costs are and how much the article processing charges um, pay for. So um, we have quite a substantial um, staff. Um, I also get paid as a deputy editor, senior editors get paid, reviewing editors um, depends on what their workload is. They get a small um, um, stipend. So the answer is, so with 40 some full-time staff and then, you know, that includes a lot of the development of the software and whatnot. So um, there are serious costs uh, uh, associated with, with publishing. So that has to come from, from somewhere. And so, of course, publishing can be free in the sense if you submit to a commercial journal, but then um, the access is not free. And as you all know, um, eLife is open access, so you don't have to pay for um, reading eLife articles. Um, the eLife processing charges are very high. So what's the procedure or criteria to waive off the charges? So um, our, our, I would say our charges are sort of middle of the road. It's, it's certainly when you look at, for example, the um, nature or cell clones, they have um, su substantially higher um, charges than, than, than we have. Um, we are, but we are not in the um, whatever, 100 or $200 range as, uh, for example, PRJ is. Um, I actually, so the, the waiving, um, uh, maybe Anya can help me out. The decision there is, is made by whom, whether or not charges are, are being um, waived. That's, uh, I assume, is the decision that's made in Cambridge is um, typically Andy making, the, our, our managing editor making those decisions. Do you know Anya? Yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so again, so what exactly happens with the article processing charges? So again, you can look this up. Let me see whether this works. If I say um, eLife um, e financial report, whether that works. Um, yeah. So if you just put in annual eLife annual report, um, I just want to make sure that this is really the, that is the one that um, eLife by numbers. Um, yes. If you just put in eLife annual report, then it will take you to our annual reports and it will um, tell you what, uh, what uh, things are being paid for. So if, for example, looking here at the 2018 report, 63% of expenditure goes to publishing, 37% goes towards technology and innovation. I mentioned that eLife wants to be more than just the journal. Uh, payments to editors of the publishing costs make up about a third, staff about 8%, online systems 9%, article processing 21%, um, our features, so this is kind of the cover part, makes up 12%, and then marketing makes up um, 14%, and then it breaks it down in thousands of uh, um, pounds, so um, please go and look at this. Um, Dimitri is asking, um, uh, thank you, Dimitri, for uh, uh, um, your, th your thanks there for the concise intro and answers. Um, and uh, do you have any upcoming plans to introduce soon any new text, such as the first computational reproducible um, uh, paper was? Um, well, so for example, we um, were part of the initiative that you know data are directly connected to a to, to figures, which I think is an important um, advance. We also had technically, this is less on the um, uh, data to paper side, but more in terms of how you read it. We you know, came up with a number of innovations, how you actually um, read papers uh, um, online. Um, yeah, I see that that's what you um, uh, uh, just referred to interactivity in, 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 in papers. So. Yeah, so um, that I have to kick this over to Maria or um, Anya. <coughs> um, 
Yeah. I can't uh, answer this right now in terms of um, how easily we could put this into, uh, into uh, make this a reality. But Dimitri, if you send me an email afterwards, we, we can discuss it. So, mm -hmm. so that left Maria yeah. here. Hi. Yeah. So, so I'm part of the live staff, everyone. Nice to, to meet you all. So I know that the innovation team is currently testing the reproducible document stack mm -hmm. process with some authors at submission. Mm -hmm. um, so we are looking to start publishing a few papers, I would say, within the next few weeks. But again, if this is something you're interested in learning more about, feel free to get in touch with, with me or that left directly and we can put you in touch with the relevant person. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, Pavitrana has another question here. So um, how concerned are we about maintaining, boosting our impact uh, factor number? So um, if you, we've published quite extensively or commented quite extensively on this. So we truly do not look at impact factors. So I don't know exactly where our impact factor is. So sometimes people do complain to me that it is not where they think it should be. Um, we don't really look at this because we don't publish reviews. I'm sure our uh, impact factor is lower than that of some of our um, um, competitors. So we think um, work really has to speak for itself. And we, from the very beginning, be strong uh, uh, supporter of uh, ultrametrics or other measures of how impactful individual, um, individual papers are. So again, so we are not concerned about it at all. And when you look at you know, the number of submissions, um, we, um, uh, Maria, do you remember how many papers we publish now? So our submissions are um, close to 10,000 a year now. We um, publish uh, something like 16% or so. So it's interesting that nobody has asked this, but I'll, I'll bring it up anyway. So in the initial triage process, um, about um, two thirds of papers are returned to the authors and about one third we uh, decide to send for full submission. And then once you go to full submission, the chances of getting accepted um, is about 50-50. So that's really not um, bad at all. So in the end, it's about 16% or so per submissions that we publish. But so with close to 10,000 papers a year, you see that this is well over 1,000 papers, which we now publish um, per year. And when you look at how we have developed, that we it really, you know, from the very beginning, it was very nice um, growth of, of, of eLife. And so we have uh, continued to grow and we've had years where it was flat and then it went up again. So recently it went up again. So the fact that we ignore impact factor, it does not seem to have hurt us. I know with other journals, like uh, don't wanna name any names, but which uh, other journals that I've been associated with, uh, community journals, not commercial journals, that they have felt strongly that they are certain, you know, key, numbers that they had to, to, to reach and that that was more is more important to them than anything else. But this is very much driven by that quite a few community journals are worrying about the number of submissions they get. And that's really uh, the least of our worries, I would um, say. Yeah, so Maria says about 120 publications per, per month. And there's also in the chat box is a link to uh, metrics. Um, so Frida is asking, I don't see any big advantage to, to um, publish in, in, in eLive. So yeah, the, the big advantage is really how you're being um, treated by the reviewers and, and editors. So again, we are certainly not um, perfect, but I think on average, average, we treat our authors a lot better than the way they are being treated at uh, other journals, again, that you get you know, so um, feedback that is substantial and much clearer guidance is a big advantage. And that our ambition is, and it has been a little bit different in, 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 in COVID-19 time now, but um, our ambition in normal times has been to only suggest um, revisions where we think that they can be done within two months so that you, you know, really have a good idea. And and really to only invite revisions when we are essentially certain that they can be done. And um, I don't uh, know the numbers right off the top of my head, but the vast majority of papers where we invite revisions, we then also publish. And again, that's different from you know, some other um, high level journals where you get invited to revision and you still don't really have a good feel for whether or not 
um, they will eventually publish your work. Um, so here it says, whenever we submit, so Santilal again, whenever we submit pre-submission inquiry, was a failure of a chance for review or more when we do full submission. Is it okay to do full submission even after rejection from pre-submission inquiry? So I assume the question here is full submission is the, uh, was the preprint review, if I understand it correctly. So if um, it was submitted in the normal way, so we don't really have the pre-submission, we only have this initial submission. So at eLife, if you submit it with a normal track, the initial submission it would, was a decline, then you cannot um, submit again through the preprint review where we commit to um, reviewing. And then another question here is, what are the main mistakes that you see in the in new investigator, investigator papers that, that, that one should avoid? Well, I think uh, with, with any paper, the, 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 you, that there is um, this, this trade-off. So you want to, of course, emphasize what is new, what is great, what is cool about your work, but you still want to be reasonable. So you don't want to, you know, um, a common mistake, and it doesn't matter whether you're young or junior or senior or old or whatever, is to um, claim things that go um, beyond um, what is actually in the paper itself. Just, um, Today, somebody asked me for feedback on, on, on their submission. It was not eLife, it was something else. Just a, um, a colleague said, you know, can you tell me what, you know, what would you do with this paper? And I noticed that um, in the paper itself, in the manuscript, they were talking about the association between something and something else. And then the title said, was actually not association, that A and B were associated with each other. The title said, A causes B. Okay, so, but that's not what the paper has said. And it's clear, clearly they had put this claim in the title because they thought then it's more likely that an editor will look at it. And that's probably true, more likely that an editor will look at it, but also I think reduces then your chance that the reviewers take it, uh, um, take it seriously if you exaggerate um, your claims. But again, Elife, we really want to work with authors. And one of the things that we have done in, 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 in the COVID-19 time, that we really try hard to minimize what we ask for in terms of um, revisions, that we really double down on our efforts to look at the paper at hand and not this, I referred to this earlier, this imaginary paper, you know, what is the paper that I would write if I would work on this, but really the paper at hand, minimize the reviews. And then in COVID-19, we've actually actually gone so far that we've said, look, um, let's think hard whether additional experiments are really, really necessary. And uh, if in the end we decide they are not absolutely necessary or would be just nice to have, we told authors, okay, look, tune down your claims, we'll publish your work, there are a few more experiments that would be nice to do, and we expect you to do them after the COVID-19 time is, is over, and then you can send it to us as a research advance or just put it on, on, on bioarchive, um, whatever you think is, fits, fits best. Um, and you just uh, uh, put two, other, two more links here in the chat, our author guide, and uh, um, yeah, our policy about preprints and scoop protection. That's perhaps also important, thank you. And yeah, uh, um, for reminding me, and that goes back to uh, Frida's question, what's a big advantage of publishing in eLife? So the scoop protection is something else that we have. A couple of other journals now have this as well. So if you submit something to us, and while we are reviewing your paper, another paper comes out on, you know, that is very, very similar. Um, if your paper is already under review with us, we will not hold it against you that another paper is out there, but we will look at your paper and consider would we have published, uh, would we, you know, have published your paper, um, even if we didn't know about this uh, other paper that is out there. Um, and then also a link from Anya towards uh, what we're doing to support research culture in, in general. And Papatran is asking, do um, social media comments influence reviewers and editors? Um, that's, uh, that's a, perhaps you've, um, uh, uh, Papatran, maybe you have uh, followed some of the Twitter exchanges. I don't think I um, contributed directly to this. Maybe I have uh, retweeted one of these. So there was um, 
there was an observation that supposedly um, papers who uh, had gotten social media, a lot of social media attention, preprints that had gotten a lot of, a lot of social media attention, um, also were uh, more, accrued more um, citations afterwards. So I'm not sure a cause and effect was proper there. So if something is likely to, you know, get attention, then of course, I think it's likely to get attention on social media, but also get attention um, later on. So I would hope that at eLive, whether or not something has gotten attention in, this, in social media will not, you know, play uh, any role whether or not we should uh, um, uh, submit it, uh, we, we should consider it for, for full review. All right. Are there any more questions coming? So, Anya, I think, uh, have I overlooked any question there? No, so I think you, oh, there's one more. Just one yeah, more. there's one more. Um, um, there are articles which cover all aspects from, you know, single cell to whole organismal. Uh, can a, essentially, can a paper have data from too many diverse uh, fields? What do you do to select reviewers for this kind of papers? Um, yeah, so I mean, that's one of the advantages with uh, um, our process. So especially when it's uh, these uh, transdisciplinary papers. So experience, I think, as reviewers look at this, they know one area, and this is basically what they comment on, and they will say, I'm not really qualified to um, comment on the other part. And then it's really, really helpful to have this discussion among the reviewers because they can educate and inform you of them, the, uh, each other. And I would hope that with three reviewers, you could cover um, most things. All right, good. All right, this is your last chance to ask uh, any more question, but of course you can also just uh, afterwards email me or Anya. So, all right, good, cool. All right, Emery is asking, should we just uh, apply? I didn't quite understand this. Oh, well, what should we do to become, oh, I missed that, to become a reviewer for eLive? Um, we have, um, we, we had for um, certain areas, we had a self-nomination uh, um, um, process. I, uh, it's not clear yet whether we're gonna um, do this again, but of course it doesn't hurt if you write to us and nominate yourself as a, as a, as a reviewer. So we certainly have had reviewers that we got through people just writing to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people can apply to become an uh, early career uh, reviewer. Maria just put this in there. All right, great. Thank you very much. Anything, uh, Maria or Anya, you want to add? No, that's everything. Just thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you very much then.